All right, praise God. Somebody must have prayed. <laughs> All of you were praying, no doubt. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Quincy, California. Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. We're going to be starting in verse 1 this morning. You know, I always think that, that when we have technical difficulties, the Lord is going to do something amazing, you know? Uh, oftentimes, uh, the Bible says that Satan is the prince of the power of the air, and I think he, he controls Bluetooth, you know, and <laughs> Wi-Fi, and, and the internet, and all those things, and, and so uh, oftentimes we have some difficulty with that, but that's, that's when I think God is going to do something really amazing. So the theme of the Gospel of Matthew, as you know, is the Gospel of the King. And, and this morning, we're going to see the return of king, the King and what happens when the King comes back because there are events that take place when our King comes back. And so we're going to look at that this morning. The key verse is Matthew chapter 27, verse 37. This is Jesus, the King the King of the Jews and the King of every man and woman that would put their faith and trust in Him alone. As you know, if you've been following along through the Gospel of Matthew with us, uh, where we're at in chapter 25 this morning is the third day since Jesus has arrived back in Jerusalem for the Feast of Passover, the final week before His crucifixion and resurrection. Now, Jesus has left Jerusalem at the end of this third day. He's ascended the Mount of Olives uh, opposite Jerusalem. Now, after telling His disciples that Jerusalem would be destroyed, the temple would be left desolate, your house will be left to you desolate, and, and that not one stone would be left upon another that would not be thrown down, the disciples came to him privately. They were worried about all that. And they said to him, tell us. Well, tell us when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Chapters 24 and 25 called the Olivet Discourse because he spoke these things on the Mount of Olives. Chapters 24 and 25 answer those three questions. And Jesus' answers are not about the church. They're about the future of Israel and this Christ-rejecting world. What's going to happen at the end of the age? And at the end of the age, the church is not here. Chapter 24 describes a period of time at the end of the age that will be the most horrible and difficult time in all of human history. By some estimates, as we read through what takes place in the book of Revelation, in the last seven years of human history before the return of Christ, by some estimates, half of the earth's population has perished. There's about 8 billion people on the planet right now. That would be 4 billion people have perished by that time. It will be a time marked by a severe increase in the frequency and intensity of deception. Wars, ethnic strife, famines, diseases, earthquakes, persecution of believers, betrayal, and lawlessness. Culminating, all of that culminating in the battle of Armageddon before the return of Christ to set up His kingdom. So at the conclusion of that age, which lasts seven years, Christ returns to set up his kingdom. And chapter 25 of the Gospel of Matthew continues that discourse that began in chapter 24. And it is still, and this is why we mention this, 
because we want to keep chapter 25 in context, it is still about the future of Israel and of this Christ-rejecting world. And it has to do with what takes place when Christ returns. And there's three groups of people that will be mentioned in chapter 25 that are dealt with in chapter 25. First and foremost, Israel. Second, all believers, tribulation saints, who remain at his coming. And third, the nations of the world. Okay? Christ will deal with all three of those at his return. So keep that in mind as we go through chapter 25. Jesus tells several parables. But these parables are not about the church. Now we, the church can gain a lot of application, you see, from these parables. We can apply many of the principles that Jesus speaks about here in these parables to us. But the meaning is not for us. The meaning is for Israel, believers who remain, and this Christ-rejecting world. But the fact that there is an application for us is evident by chapter 24, verse 44. Where, after saying this in verse 42, to watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming, he then turned to his disciples, you see, and he made it personal. And he said this, he said, therefore, you also. So in addition to those who were having to watch, therefore, because they don't know when the Lord's coming, he said to his disciples, you also. So in addition to them watching, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect. So just like those who remain on earth during the tribulation must watch, we the church must also, just like them, we must also be ready because our Lord and Savior could come back at any moment to take us home. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, as I mentioned last week, and I'm going to mention again, and I've already mentioned it several times, the church will not be here during the tribulation. We are not going to experience the wrath of God because Christ has already taken the wrath of God upon himself for us. Amen? Amen. That's how this works. If Christ has taken God's wrath for us, if he has paid the penalty for our sin for us, then we have no penalty left to pay, you see. The wrath has been fully satisfied by Christ. In fact, we read this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. It says, For God did not appoint us, speaking to the church, for God did not appoint us to wrath, what wrath? The coming wrath, the seven-year tribulation period, you see. God has not appoint, appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, with that introduction, hopefully you're ready for this. Buckle your seatbelts. If you're not already there, turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, starting in verse 1 as we continue through the Olivet Discourse. Then, so at his coming, then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now this parable in verses 1 through 13 is about what happens to Israel at the return of Christ to set up his kingdom. The remainder of the chapter then describes what happens to the, the non-Jewish believers and then the nations of the world at Christ's return. So none of chapter 25 is about the church, even though you may, you may have heard many, many sermons that said it was. But we can find lots of application here, and I will, I will weave in some application that is meaningful to us as we go through this. Now in this verse, we see that the kingdom of heaven will be or shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet 
the bridegroom. This verse describes the return of the bridegroom. That's Jesus. From the wedding ceremony, which took place, by the way, at the Father's house in heaven on their way to the bride's house, which is earth. Okay? Typical Jewish wedding ceremony. The father tells the son to go get his bride, right? That's the day or hour that no one knows right now, right? Go get your bride. So he goes and gets his bride, takes his bride back to the, his, the father's house. That's where the marriage ceremony takes place. After the marriage ceremony and the marriage is consummated, they return to the bride's house for the marriage feast. And I know, I know there's a lot of, of different opinions about that. But that's my opinion. That's how I see this all laying out. So they return to the, the bride's house for the marriage feast at that time. And that's what we have taking place here in this parable. Okay? Now along the way, as they're going, the call goes out and we're going to see that. The, the bridegroom comes, right? And, and so the, they're met by ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now follow me closely here. The ten virgins went out to meet the bridegroom. The ten virgins are not the bride. Everybody agree with that? Ten virgins are not the bride. So this is not the church going out to meet Jesus, right? In fact, the bride isn't even mentioned in this parable. Only the bridegroom is mentioned. Why is that? It's because this parable is not about the church, you see. It's about what happens to Israel at Christ's return. That's how we know the fact that these are ten virgins and not the bride. That's how we know this is not about the church. These ten virgins represent Israel. The bridegroom, of course, represents Christ. And the bride is not even mentioned in this parable because this is not about the bride. We are the bride of Christ, right? It's not about us. Now, verses 2 through 4. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So when Christ returns, some in Israel will be ready. They will be prepared for his return. They are wise, you see. They took oil in their lamps, right? Oil is usually a symbol of the, the Holy Spirit. So they are, they are born again Jews who have received Christ. They recognize their Messiah and they've, they've accepted him. They're ready for his return. We're going to see they're even looking for his return. But then there were the foolish. And the foolish in Israel were unprepared for the return of the Messiah. And when I think of the purpose of a lamp, okay, the purpose of a lamp is to light the way. It's so that you can see something. That's why I have a flashlight at night, so that I can see in the dark. So I think the lamp here speaks of those who are looking to see the return of their Messiah, Jesus, whom we call Christ. They were not only prepared, you see, but they were looking and expecting to see the return of Christ. The others, the foolish, not so much. They weren't looking and they weren't ready. Maybe they thought they had more time. Maybe they thought they had more time. They didn't. No one really has more time. Do you know that? Yep. No one really has more time. You have as much time as God has given you and no more and no less. But, verse 5, while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. So the delay spoken of here is a period of time. And I think it's the period of time between the ascension of Christ and after, that is after his resurrection 
and his return, which we are addressing here. In fact, according to the book of Daniel, chapter 9, the prophetic clock for Israel stopped when the Messiah was cut off. If you know your, 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 your Daniel chapter 9, you know that 70 weeks, 70 prophetic weeks, 490 years are determined upon your people, he told Daniel, which are Israel. At the 69th week, the 69th prophetic week, that's 483 years, right? Something like that. Messiah was cut off. Okay? But not for himself. He was cut off for our sins. That word cut off means to be executed for a capital crime. At that point, at the 69th week, the prophetic clock stopped ticking. And we're now in this period of time called the church age. But when the church is gone, raptured to heaven, the prophetic clock begins to tick again toward the 70th week and the completion of God's plan for Israel and for this world. So that's what's taking place here while, they, while the bridegroom was delayed. Okay? Now during that time, between the ascension of Christ and, and the return of Christ, Israel slumbered and slept. And that's not to say that they were, uh, they were lazy or anything. They were all slumbering and sleeping, the wise and the foolish. It's as if Israel has been sleepwalking for the last 2,000 years. But as we will see, some will awaken, and they will awaken prepared, you see, at the end of the age, just before the return of Christ, many in Israel will awaken and realize their Messiah was Jesus. It says they will look upon him whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. They'll awaken, you see, but they'll awaken looking for their Messiah. They'll awaken prepared for their Messiah. Others will awaken, but they will awaken in unbelief and they will remain in unbelief. Look at verse 6. And at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. So at the conclusion of the wedding ceremony, which took place in heaven at the Father's house, the wedding party begins its, process, its procession, returning from the Father's house to the bride's house for the marriage feast. And in ancient Israel, uh, usually the whole village was invited to the marriage feast. In this case, in this parable, all Israel is invited. The cry goes out to all Israel. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Christ is coming. The Messiah is coming. Go out to meet him. Then, verse 7, all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. So when Israel finally awakens and realizes the return of their Messiah is at hand, some will be ready, some will be prepared to meet him. But others will be unprepared. There will be no fire of faith, no light to see, no oil in their lamp. And I want you to notice here carefully. You can't give your oil away. You can't give your light away. You can't give your faith to others. Each man and woman must have faith for themselves. You can share your faith. You can share your light, in a sense, by speaking the gospel to them. But you can't save them, you see. You can't give them saving faith. Only Christ can. And only they can receive it for themselves. That's why they tell them, they're not being selfish here. We're not going to share our oil with you. That's not a selfish thing. You can't share your oil with them, you see. Go. To those who sell and buy for yourselves, go get some faith for yourselves and otherwise, right? They can only be saved 
by putting their faith in the person and work of Christ alone. No one can do that for them. And as we're going to see in this parable, it is now too late for them. It is now too late for them. If they have not received their Messiah by the time the Messiah comes back, it is too late. There are no more chances. That's hard to hear, but it's true. We'll see it in this parable. The door is shut, and there are no more opportunities for salvation. Look at verses 10 through 12. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Now, I know there is disagreement on this, but again, I think from this parable, it's clear that the wedding feast takes place here on earth, not in heaven. The marriage ceremony takes place in heaven, but the marriage feast takes place on earth at the return of the bridegroom with his bride, and that is what is in view here. The five wise virgins, those who were ready, went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. And the idea that the door was shut ought to scare anyone and everyone, regardless of whether they're the church age or not. Now we know that during this age, the church age, heaven's door is open to any and all who would receive Christ as their Lord and Savior, irregardless if it's even the last hour of their life. The thief on the cross proves that to us. But there is coming a time, in fact, two distinct times, when the door will be closed. The first door will be closed is the church door. It's hard to imagine the church doors being closed, but the church door will be closed at the rapture of the church. There will be no new members added to the church after the church has been raptured. Those who remain and come to faith in Christ will be tribulation saints after that. Okay? Or they will be Israel, but they will not be the church. The church is gone, and its completed number is in heaven now. And we see that in the book of Revelation, where we see 24 elders. That number speaks of a completed body. Okay? There are 24 elders in heaven representing the church, singing a new song that only the church could sing. Okay, So that's the first door that's closed at the rapture. No new members are added to the church. Too late then. You can still get saved, but you're going to be saved through fire. You're going to be saved during the most horrible and terrible time in human history. A time when the Antichrist will persecute all believers, both Jew and Gentile. So you better get saved now. You better get saved before the trumpet blows and the dead in Christ are risen and, and we who are alive are caught up and the church is gone because it's over then. The second door that will be closed is at the coming of Christ. Anyone and everyone who has not received Christ, both Jew and Gentile, at the return of Christ, if they have not received him by that time, heaven's door is closed. The kingdom of God's door is closed at that time. And there will be a judgment. We'll see that uh, Wednesday as we look at the, the judgment of the nations. There will be a judgment at that time. And that should scare the hell right out of you. Amen? <laughs> and it's intended to do that. It's intended to do that. Look at verse 13. Watch, therefore... For you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So this is a warning by Jesus. It's a warning to be watchful for His return. We're talking about the second coming. Talking to Israel. Lest they be unprepared. Lest they don't have any oil in their lamp at His coming. They're not saved. 
It's the end of the age. The tribulation is coming to a close. Christ has now returned. And if you haven't received Him by then, you're going to be unprepared at His coming. So He warns them to watch, to be ready, to be prepared. The King, you see, is coming back. The King is coming back. And no one knows the day or hour of His return. So they must be prepared. They must watch for His return. They must expect His return. Just like we, the church, must be looking and expecting the return of Christ any moment for us, they too must be looking for and expecting the return of their Messiah, not to catch them up, but to establish His kingdom on earth. For the church, the application would be, don't be left behind. Don't be left behind. Because not everyone that goes to church is a member of the church. Only those who believe in the person and work of Christ alone for them are the church. Those are the saved. We, we, we often refer to the saved as what? Believers, right? Believers. They're the ones that believe. But there are people that go to church that do not believe. Okay? You see, only believers are saved, not churchgoers. And that's important to recognize. We must believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that the Son of God has died for our sins and paid the price for us in full. And if we believe that, then we're saved. We are believers, you see. So the application for us is don't be left behind. Believe in Jesus today. And you will be going with the church to heaven for the wedding. Now next, Christ gives us another parable. And this one, as I mentioned, is now addressed to the remaining professed believers at his coming again this is not about the church it's about the tribulation saints and those who profess to be saints just like i i mentioned earlier there are church goers who are not church members so too during the tribulation there will be people who associate with the people of god but that aren't truly believers and christ will sort that out at the end as well look at verse 14 for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. So in this parable, the man traveling to a far country is Christ. His own servants are the tribulation saints and the far country is heaven. And his goods are the, the gifts, abilities, resources, and time that he gives to men. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, we read this. It says, but to each one. What does each one mean? Each one. Every one of you who are believers. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. So we also, the church, we also have gifts. We have abilities. We have resources. And we have time that has been given to us for the kingdom of God. What we do with them will determine our heavenly rewards. What the tribulation saints do with them will determine their eternal destiny. Look at verse 15. And to one... He gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. And what I want you to notice here, what we can gather from this by way of application for ourselves, is that Christ will give out talents. Now, now that word talents literally means uh, 
it's a monetary sum. And by the way, when you get to the guy with one talent, this monetary sum, a talent was equal to about 6,000 denarius. That's 20 years of labor. So one talent's a lot of money, you see. Even one talent is a lot. But we can also look at talents as our gifts, our abilities, our resources, our time. And he gives those, it says, to each according to his own ability. You see, Jesus is not going to ask you or anyone else to do that which you are unable to do. But he will hold you accountable for that which you are able to do. Every one of us, you see, has some ability. We have some gifts. We've got some time okay, in this life that we can use for Christ. Use Use what He has given you. Use what He's given you. Whether it's a spiritual gift, whether it's an ability, whether it's a resource, whether it's just your time, use what He has given you for His kingdom. Amen? Just like them, we need to use what Christ gives to us. And that's the, the application side of this for us, the church. Then, verse 16, he who had received the five talents went and traded them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who received uh, two gained two more also. So these men in the parable used what Christ gave them and they gained. They, they, they had an increase. Okay? Uh, they were trading those talents. You know, Maybe they had a, a spiritual stock market or something. I don't know. But they traded the talents and they, they gained. They had an increase. But, verse 18, he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. So this man didn't use what he was given by his master. He went and dug in the ground and, 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 and he buried the Lord's money. He was given a talent according to his ability. It wasn't more than he could handle. But it appears that it was more than he could be bothered with. You see? It was more than he could be bothered with. He went and hid his master's money. He buried it in the ground. Now look at verses 19 through 21. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. That's a scary thought, isn't it? So, he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. Seems like he was surprised at that. He's surprised that whatever he got from the Lord, he used, and, and the Lord gave him an increase. He was surprised. Look, look, I got five more of them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. And look, look, I have gained two more talents beside him. I think he's again surprised at that. I'm often surprised if God ever uses me. I, I, I go home and tell my wife, look what God did, you know. I'm always surprised by it. And his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. What I want you to notice here is that both the servant who received five talents, and the servant who received two talents, who had each doubled their master's money, each of them received the exact same reward. The exact same reward. Their master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. That's the same exact resort, reward. Both the man who, who had five talents and earned five and the man who had two talents and earned two, 
got the same reward. See, if you, and we're just going to apply this to the church, okay? So we can gain some application here for us. So if you are faithful or are as faithful, okay? If you are as faithful with your talent as Billy Graham was with his, you will receive the exact same reward as him. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that wonderful? God only expects out of you that which he has given you the ability to do. He will not require more of you than you had the ability to do. But he has given you gifts, abilities, resources, and time. So use them well. Use them for his kingdom. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Then, verse 24, he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I don't think this guy was very excited, by the way. He said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered. And I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. This is what we commonly call excuses. This man had all sorts of excuses as to why he didn't use the gifts, abilities, resources, and time that his master had given him. He might have well as just buried his head in the ground. It seems that he just did not want to work for the kingdom of God. He'd rather have excuses why he couldn't work. So he went and hid the master's talent in the ground. And then he had the, he had the audacity to say to his master, look, there, you have what's yours. Now, again, I know the primary application of this is to the tribulation saints. But far too many Christians are just like this. They're unwilling to lift a finger for the kingdom of God. They have gifts. They have abilities. They have resources. They have time. But they're, they're not moved in their hearts to use those things. Those things they've been given by God, for God, and for His kingdom. They will lose their reward. They will lose their reward. Look now at verses 26 through 27. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. From this verse, we can, we can likewise, again, gather an application for ourselves. There's a lot of us here, no offense, it's me too, but there's a lot of us here that are past our prime. <laughs> Amen? Amen? We're no longer candidates for the mission field, right? <laughs> or any other field. Most of us struggle just to, to get out of bed and into our own field in the morning. It seems as if our ability to serve God has been limited. But it's not. Notice what the, the master said to the wicked and lazy servant. He said, he said, you should have deposited my money with the bankers. That at my coming I would have received my own with interest. You see, if we can no longer go out. If we can no longer get up and get going. There are still things we can do. First, we can support those who do go out. Amen? We had an opportunity this past year to, to help fund. Uh, Damien's daughter is going on a, on a short mission trip this summer. And we helped to support that 
work going forward. We also recently put some information on the counter regarding far-reaching ministries. And I know several of you picked up the flyers for far-reaching ministries and, and the work that they're doing to save children in South America from the sex trafficking trade. We can get behind the work that they are doing, you see. Last year, we, we uh, put together, I can't remember how many shoe boxes, over 100 shoe boxes for Operation Christmas Child. And those went out into the world to children along with the gospel message, you see. That's using our resources for the kingdom of God, you see. Some of you support our, our dear sister Jenna Wershing, uh, who is serving the Lord over in Feltre, Italy, at the Calvary Chapel there. So there's lots of opportunity. And some of you just, just help support this ministry, right? Amen. So there's lots of ways that we, even as we grow older, even as we are, are maybe constrained in one way or another, either we're younger and we got a pile of kids in the house, or we're older and, and we can't get out of the house, right? <laughs> So there are ways that we can, we can serve the Lord with what we have, with what he has given us. So we're not as limited as we think. Amen? Because sometimes we sit there and we hear a message like this and we think, good golly molly, I'm not doing anything for the Lord. What can I do for the Lord? Well, there are some ideas right there, things that you can do for the Lord. Amen? And you will by no means lose your reward when you do that. These are things that we can do. And I know that there are others in the body of Christ, even here, who use their abilities to help others. Some of you are mechanically inclined and you help others with that ability. Maybe fixing a car, fixing a washing machine, whatever it may be. Some of you have time on your hands and you use that time to pray for others or, or to encourage others. You see, there's all kinds of ways that we can use our gifts, our abilities, our resources, and our time for the kingdom of God. Just like these folks in the tribulation period, they still have opportunity to serve the Lord. Now back to our text. Look at verses 28 and 29. Therefore, because the wicked servant went and buried his talent, therefore take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. God will give you more if you run out of things to do. <laughs> if you use up all your resources for the kingdom of God, then God will give you more resources. You will never be able to outgive God. Amen? Amen? Just don't give to those guys on TV <laughs> peddling holy water, okay? Don't, don't give to those guys. Now look at verse 30, our final verse this morning. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Boy, that doesn't sound like a good thing, does it? This is a statement of eternal judgment. Remember that although we've drawn some application for ourselves, for the church here, this is not about the church. This is about those Gentiles living during the tribulation period who profess to be servants of God, but who do nothing to prove that they are servants of God. They are cast into the outer darkness at the return of Christ. They go straight to hell, in other words. And, and look at the description. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When they realize that they have rejected Christ, they have rejected the Messiah. When they realize that and they find themselves in hell, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's a stern warning of judgment from Jesus, isn't it? 
And I know some people don't like to hear that. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. And they don't like to see Jesus as a judge. But not only is Jesus our Savior, but Jesus is also a judge. And here he gives out a stern warning of eternal judgment to fake believers. To fake believers. To church goers, but not believers. To tribulation saints who aren't really saints. They are ain'ts, not saints. It's a stern warning of judgment. So, don't be a fake believer. Amen? Amen. Be a genuine believer in Jesus Christ and you won't have to worry about any of these things. Wow. That's a lot, isn't it? These two chapters are a lot to unpack. But I want to encourage you, the more often you read these chapters, the more often you hear these things, the easier it becomes to understand it all and see how it all fits together and to see what Jesus' purpose in these chapters is. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're going to pray here and close. I'm not going to end with anything more than that. We've had a lot this morning. So let's invite the worship team back up for one final song as we end. Heavenly Father, once again, thank you for your word. Thank you that you have placed these things here in your word. And, and thank you, Lord, that we can draw some instruction from these things. Even though they are not written to us specifically, we can learn from them. We can take an application from them. We can apply these things to our own life right here and right now. So we thank you for that. And I pray, God, that by your Holy Spirit, you will speak to each and every one of our hearts that we, Lord, will be ready, watching, expecting your return at any moment for us and that we uh, will be using those things that you have given us while we wait for your return. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And everybody said, Amen, Amen. 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 Let's close with a song that celebrates the fact